those people are going to be entering, but we did get registration from all over our diocese, which is fabulous. And so people will can probably continue to enter. So Sayedna, mm -hmm. our first question, what does it, and if you put it on speaker mode on your computer, then you'll see the speaker, whoever's speaking on the big thing. So on the top right, where it says view, if you go to speaker, that person will be bigger on your screen. Sure. So what the first question, say Edna, what does it mean or what is the significance <laughs> of being an Antiochian Orthodox Christian? That's a very important question. I think we need in the Archdiocese to know what is the meaning of to be Antiochian Church, Orthodox Church. You know, first, the Orthodox Church is not one church. It is more than one church. Different families have the same faith, the same rites, the same worship, the same spirituality. So we are a, a body of different families. Uh, we are Antiochian church. That means we uh, belong to the first the church was assisted, established by the apostles of Christ, St. Peter and Paul. Antioch is a city, now it is in uh, South Turkey, uh, but it used to be in North, Northern Syria uh, during the history. This city was very great, like Paris, New York today. Uh, Antioch, Alexandria, and Rome were the most the three largest cities and more uh, most educated cities in the Roman Empire. In Antioch, uh, for the first time, the disciples of Christ were called Christian. Before that, they used to call uh, Christianity as a way, uh, the way. And they couldn't differentiate at that time, until that time, between uh, Judaism and the Christianity. In Antioch, for the first time, we were called Christian. So we belong to the oldest church in the world. What is the significance of Antioch today. Antioch today is the only Orthodox Church which is free of ethnicity. All the Orthodox, other Orthodox churches are the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Roman Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox. And, and these names mean one nation, while in Antioch, we are Antiochian Orthodox, but we are not one nation. There are Arab, there are different countries of Arabs, there are American, there are many converts, there are Australian, German, French, British, from all the world. We are Christian first. We look in Antioch for Christ. We don't look to ethnicity and then Christ as the other Orthodox churches. This is something very important we should know. And this is not just now. Antioch is multicultural church and beyond the ethnicity since the beginning. For example, now we have some conflicts in our archdiocese from time to time here and there. Do we use Arabic? We should not use English. We, we need more Arabic, we need more English and something like that, you know. But in Antioch, from the very beginning, we used to pray in different languages on the seashore of Mediterranean cities, which were educated cities and the Greek cities. We used to pray in Greek. Inside Syria, to the east, the popular language 
was Syriac. We used to pray in Syriac until the 17th century. In, inside Syria, we used to pray in Syriac. We are the, the Orthodox, not the Syriac church. Um, in Thaus, Syria, there were Arabic tribes, and we used to pray in Arabic. In Northern, there were, where is Turkey now, there were, uh, there was an Armenian kingdom. We used to pray in Armenian. Saint Sava, who is my patron, Saint, had a great monastery in Palestine. It is existed until now. During his time, there were thousands of monks. Some Armenian and Ethiopian came to him to be monks in his monastery. He built to them special church to pray inside the church, inside the monastery, to pray in uh, their native language, in Armenian. So to be Antioch, it means we are pure Christian and Christ is over everything. Christ is the first. We don't put Christ in the service of our nationality, of our ethnicity, of our culture. Everything is, is the service of Christ. For this reason, we as Antiochian could, and we still until now, play the role of a bridge between the Orthodox churches, the other Orthodox churches. And during history, until the present, Many times the Patriarch of Antioch and the Holy of Ant Synod of Antioch uh, uh, was called by some conflicted uh, Orthodox churches, unfortunately, to find solution to them because we are a neuter and we look to Christ. I make it in, in short words that Antioch is looking to Christ first. For this reason, everything is in the service of Christ. And the Christ is the first in our life. For this reason, we, we have to be proud because we are Antiochian. That means we can serve the evangelization of our, of our faith. Uh, don't you ask yourself, why the convert in 1986 came to Antioch, not to the Greek, not to the Russian, to, not to the other jurisdictions, why they came to Antioch? Because Antioch is the first and the only, sorry, Antioch was the only Orthodox church said to them, you are welcome, ahlan wa sahlan. We are the only Orthodox Church open the door for them because we don't look at culture first, at language first. We look at Christ. This is the significance of Antioch. Okay, thank you very much, Sayedna. The next question we received, if the Theotokos had said no, to carrying the Christ child, what would have happened? Uh, this is a virtual question. <laughs> Theoretically, it's a question. She said yes, and that's it. It was done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. <clears throat> but we know, we know through our Holy Fathers, the teachers, our teachers in the church, that uh, Theotokos, as a woman, as a human being, had the freedom to say no, but she didn't. And we know that God waited long time until he sent his angel to the Theotokos to preach her and to ask her. God knows that he, he waited also long time because he knows he couldn't find purer human being than the Theotokos. And she will say, yes, but 
she was free according to our faith. And she had the whole freedom to say no, but she didn't. For this reason, she is our example in the obedience to God, to God. You know, in Arabic and in the Semitic languages, there, there is something very beautiful. Let me, for orthodox, let me explain to you. In English, we say God is holy and saints are holy. Isn't it? Yes. The same word. We use the same words. In Arabic and the Semitic languages, we differentiate between two words. We call God is holy in Arabic and in Syriac, for example, <coughs> we use special, specific word to God. Holy is Qiddis in Arabic. But God is not Qiddis. God is more than Qiddis. He is the source of sanctity. For this reason, in Semitic languages, we say God is Qiddus. While human beings who were sanctified, be, they become holy. So we say to the saint, holy. But to God, not holy, more than holy, Quddus. In the Semitic, for, in Arabic, Quddus for God, Quddus for man and woman. Quddus in Syriac for God, and Quddus for man and woman. Theotokos is the only one, more than Quddus, and less than Quddus. We don't call Qiddis Maryam or Qiddis Maryam. We say the most holy Theotokos. In Arabic, al al Qadasa. Because she is more than, than holy like the other human being. But she is less than holy of God. So she is the most holy. This is a very beautiful thing, but in the Semitic languages is clearer. But we, we should know it. Thank you, Sayyid. Now that's very for, for this reason, we don't say Saint Mary in Orthodox spirituality. We, we, we say Theotokos, not Saint Mary. St. Mary is very popular and not orthodox expression. It is not mis not wrong, but not pure orthodox expression. Not enough. Not enough, yeah. The next question is also about the Theotokos. It's a question received by one of our ladies from a non-orthodox friend. And yes. she, gave, she gave her answer, but she would like to know your answer. Her friend asked if the Theotokos and Jesus Christ have the same DNA. What is the difference? What is important for us if they are one DNA or no? Of course, but but uh, for our according to our faith, we believe that Christ, from the side of his mother, is whole full man. That means he is full man. He has everything. Man has it. For this reason, he has DNA and he has genetic uh, many things like his mother. Like anyone uh, big be, beget from man and woman. Uh, uh, we, we have the same uh, genes of our fathers and, and, and mothers and mother. But God has as a man, uh, Christ, sorry, Christ as a man has a mother but has no father. As a God has father but has no mother. Hmm. This is our face. But he is full man and full God. 
So we can say he has, scientifically, he has the same DNA like his mother. Thank you, Sayedna. Just a reminder, as people are coming in, if you go to the top right where it says view and click on speaker, you'll see Sayedna most of the time since he's doing most of the speaking. Our next question, Sayedna, why do some of our churches promote naming new babies on the eighth day? Isn't that Old Testament, which has been fulfilled? Yeah, because the New Testament is a fulfilling of the Old Testament. So we didn't kick out everything in the Old Testament. We use it and we consider it our book, but we interpret it and we read it on the light of Christ, on the light of the New Testament. So there are many good commandments and many good traditions and advices in the Old Testament. We still use it for this reason, we have uh, this tradition to name our babies on the uh, eighth time, like Christ was named on, and uh, circumcision on the uh, eighth day. And we take our babies on the 40 days, 40 days uh, to the church for the first time, like a Christ, because Christ did this. And we do like our Christ. Not everything in the Old Testament uh, doesn't matter to us. There are many good things. You know, when Christ was asked by some people, what are the most com important commandments to God? He told them, love your God from all your heart, all your ability." or your mind. And the second is like it, like your neighbor as, your, as, as you like yourself. The, those two commandments are from Deuteronomy uh, book in the Old Testament. So there are many good things in the Old Testament, but to read it well, we read it on the light of Christ. Thank you, Sayedna. Question number five. If we are to pray without ceasing, does prayer then continue when we are in the restroom or the shower as well? When we pray without ceasing, we don't ask such question. <laughs> to pray without ceasing is very high stage of uh, spiritual life very high and very few people who live this uh, continuous prayer. For this reason, it is very theoretical question. We need to teach our to pray every day and how we keep our mind pure and clean and how we keep the presence of God in our life and our mind. So when we get by blessing, special blessing of God to pray without ceasing, we will not ask such question. Okay, moving on. Number six, what advice do you have for young women who are starting families in today's world? I advise her to keep as possible as she can, to keep her motherhood, to not forget that she is mother, and mother gathered everyone to her. She is who, mother is who gathered the family. We should not lose the role of our mothers in this new world. Unfortunately, because women now work hard out of the house, they cannot do their role as they have to do 
inside the house or the family. And we lose many things because of this. I advise her to keep this role as possible as she can. This is a priority. Her family is a priority. Her children is a priority. We need to, to control ourselves too much this time to know how to put our priorities. Our children need many things, that's true. But at the same time, they need very essential things. We cannot give them by money and by luxury life. We should ask this question for ourselves always. How we can be good mothers? How can we build good family, Christian family? This is very important. And you can, as Antiochian woman, you can play a great role on this level to help each other, to support each other. Thank you, Sedna. Question seven. What can we do to encourage other parishes that are under different jurisdictions in the face of increasingly large shortages of priests and dwindling numbers of attendees? It is not easy, Charlie. What, what can we do to encourage them? We can open our churches for them if they have no priest and we can pray for them, but we cannot send them priests because also we, and need more priests and we have shortage of priests but we can open our churches and we can invite them to our churches and usually when another bishop or metropolitan from another orthodox church ask for help one time and one feast there is some cooperation between us as Antiochian archdiocese and the other jurisdiction um, but we cannot give our priests every every time um, because we need priests also. But we, we should open our priest, our churches until they have priests. So at the beginning of this um, gathering tonight, Sedna, you talked about how you in, you encourage us to do this kind of thing and get to know each other from other parishes. So if we have neighboring parishes of other jurisdictions, we could also invite them to our events and things that we're doing so that we have fellowship together. Yeah, yeah this is my hope. This is my request. Okay. So I live in Cleveland, Ohio, half the year, where there's Orthodox churches all over the place. And I grew up with the Orthodox churches doing a lot together of all the jurisdictions. We have to... It's different yeah. in other parts of the country where we don't have as many Orthodox churches. Yeah, sometimes it is, it is not easy because we as one archdiocese, we don't have such mutual activities with each other among the parishes which are in, neighbor, in one neighborhood, in one place. And in the last week, uh, the, I had a meeting with the youth of neighbor churches here. It was the first time they meet with each other from different churches. They were very glad, but it was the first time. Thank God we started. We should, we should encourage them to meet with each other always, yes. as the Antiochian and as the Orthodox. Next question, I already know the answer. Will Metropolitan Saba visit our parish of St. George in St. George, Utah? I am planning to visit all the parishes. But really, I need many years. It is not easy because we have about 272 parishes. Until now, I, I visited more than 90. God bless you. In one year, in one year. But it is not easy because I have many tasks 
and many services. Also, I should do all of them, but I am trying to do my best. One time I should visit them and, and all the, the parishes. I hope that. I I know that I'm not alone. I've been in awe of your travel schedule. How many parishes you have visited in this short time you've been our Metropolitan. I know I, I know every other person on this call agrees with me. It's amazing. Thank God. Thank God. I need your prayers. Happily. Question nine. This person says, Sayedna bless. We pray you are in the best of health. At our parish now during the Paschal celebrations, our parish has included a hymn for Christ is risen that is of the Appalachian hymn. And this person wants to know if you think this agrees with our Orthodox teaching. They don't think it sounds like it belongs in Orthodoxy. Look, let me be uh, so open with you and transparent. I don't know what Appalachian. I didn't meet any group or person who is Appalachian. But at the same time, we have a phenomena in our archdiocese because we, because we are open and we welcome. So we have in our parishes, Byzantine and Slavic music. We don't follow one, one music. From the beginning, we use Slavic music and Byzantine music. Some places people don't love Slavic and some places there are people who don't love and prefer Byzantine. Byzantine. But we have the both. It is a long tradition in the Archdiocese. At the same time, we have Western Rite brothers and sisters who are converted to orthodoxy and the archdiocese allowed them since maybe Saint Raphael and Sayyidna Antonius Bashir, they allowed them to keep their right and to pray according to the Western right. So Appalachian are the same, I think. So uh, we need to accept all this diversity in the archdiocese now and do our best with, with each other to help each other to be orthodox in the essence, not in, in culture. But we need to modify our culture to be orthodox more, more and more. This is a task we should do and we are doing, but it, it needs time. It needs time to have this diversity to be for richness of the archdiocese, not for the opposite. Thank you, Sayedna. The next person would like to know, um, regarding Christ is risen, which response do you believe is, uh, they said, they said, you know, indeed he is risen, or do you prefer truly is risen? And they thought that in the Bible, it, they questioned, isn't indeed used most of the time? Yeah, indeed is more popular, but the same are, uh, the both are the same meaning, have the same meaning. Indeed and truly. It is a matter of translation. You know, when you translate from one language to another, you can uh, you can translate in different choices. You say indeed, you say truly, but, but the same meaning. It is good to have the same expression, but also through time, there are many translations. When you use to say indeed, and I use for a long time to say truly, it's not easy to, to change it, especially it is not so important. We, we say the same, but in different ways. 
I don't see it so problem. Thank you, Sedna. Question 11. Every year in March, we have Antiochian Women's Month. It seems though, as if the focus has been taken off of the charitable ministry opportunities that the Antiochian women support and instead placed more heavily on encouraging women to actively participate in liturgical services with things such as homilizing and reading the epistle. Is this now the purpose of Women's Month? I'm not so convinced by, by these activities. I'm not against it because you are accustomed to do it for many years. And it is not so dangerous, but I am not convinced by this. All these movements or uh, expressions because of influence of feminism, women look for a role in the church. Its role is similar as possible as to the role of men. We in the church believe men and women are equal as human beings. But at the same time, we believe there is role for a man and there is role for women. The function of the boss is different. Man, for example, cannot be a mother. Cannot. His, psych his psychology is different. While women cannot be a father because she has feminine, female uh, psychology. We cannot change psychology of men and women. But unfortunately, now the feminist movement want to do, to cancel all the differentiation between men and women. But not all differentiations are, are wrong. They are very natural. Some differentiations are very natural. Each one of us, men or women, should look for his role, how he can do his role on the best way. So this, they want to preach one a, time, one a year and uh, to read the epistle and to be ordained a reader and to do like the men. Let us look for our uniqueness as women and do our role because the church and society also need our uniqueness as women, not to imitate the men. It is not wrong to read the epistle. But if we read the epistle, we, we, we don't become like the men. We cannot be men. We are women and men cannot be women. We should respect ourselves as we are eh? and try our best to do our role as men and women. And how we can cooperate with each other to integrate each other. Integration is, integrity is, is very important. So the net, thank you, Sedna. So the next three questions overlap and you already, they kind of branched off of the prior question. So I'm going to read all three Two of them are of one opinion and one is the opposite view. And that way it's all on the same topic and you can just speak on that topic if that's okay, Sayedna. The Which question, topic? Um, it's questions 12, 13, and 14. Let me just read those. Yeah. If mm -hmm. Orthodox tradition states that women are not able to become priests and Paul says that women are not to teach men, is it appropriate for women to be tonsured as readers, the first step into priesthood according to the Antiochian service text, and to homilize, as we are now seeing encouraged all over the U.S., aren't those <clears throat> that should be reserved for clergy? 
Question 13. More recently, we have seen women in the Greek archdiocese that have been blessed and tonsured as readers. They have even preached in our Antiochian churches. Given that the language in the Antiochian service for tonsuring of a reader says, my son, whoever, the first degree of priesthood is that of a reader. And they are given a cassock to wear, understanding understood to be a clerical garment representing death and burial of a clergyman to this world. How is this able to be for women? And that's again, referencing what's happening in the Greek archdiocese. Then the yes. similar question, but from the other view is, is it appropriate within our church teachings for women to read the epistle as an older senior? I have been honored to be a reader at various churches in my life. Today, it appears the preference is for tonsured readers only are we leaning towards male only involvements in our services? So we have two people asking, why are people being tonsured in the Greek archdiocese? And one person asking, can women still keep reading in our archdiocese or is it only tonsured men? Let me clarify some things first. Thank you. First, the reader to wear cassock is wrong. It is not traditional. Reader wear jibbe, raso, like this, and has a special color here on the collar, white or red, to, to uh, as a sign that he is chanter or reader, not cassock. One time, I should instruct all the readers to not wear cassock, and. I should give them some years because cassock is expensive <laughs> and rasu is expensive also. So, but we should have time when we wear as we have to wear according to our tradition. This is one. Second, we don't tonsure women if, uh, priest, because this is our tradition and our faith. From the very beginning, Christ has his 12 disciples, as we know. Isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. We know also through the gospel that many women used to move with him and his disciples from place to place. Those women, some of them are the Merberians who went to the uh, tomb on the third day and who preach and transmit his resurrection to the apostles. So they have a message of preaching, evangelize the people and the nations from Christ, because the angel told them, go and tell the disciples he has risen from the dead. So they have a role. But when Christ assisted the Eucharist, he didn't invite the woman. He assisted the Eucharist through the Last Supper before his crucifixion by himself and the 12 disciple apostles only. For this reason, we believe priesthood is for men only and we cannot ordain women. All these questions and this phenomena you hear now are influences of the modern culture, of the feminist movement, of the secular society. Should the church follow the secular society or the gospel? We are under the obedience of the gospel not under the obedience of the secular society. We are ready to be persecuted, 
to keep the authentic faith and to be loyal for the faith we are holding from the saints. This is the teaching of our, of our church. So women in our church and the whole Orthodox churches chant, they are members in the choirs and they are head choirs, choirs director, they, they serve and serve in teaching, in Sunday school, in lectures, they study theology, they can teach in seminaries, they, they do many things. So just priesthood. So we cannot accept women for priesthood because at that time we are traitor to the faith teaching of our Christ because he did it, didn't do that. We have many saints. Their title is equal to the apostle. It means equal to the 12 apostles. Saint Tecla, for example, her title is equal to the apostles. Saint Nina, who preached Georgia, and she is a patron saint of Georgia. She took Christ to Georgia. They were pagan. She's a woman. And she is Nina equal to apostles. We have many uh, women, great saint, uh, uh, women, uh, saints. Saint. So they have a great role. Let us help the women to play their role actively in the church because we need we need this this role. But to tonsure them reader, it is forbidden or not forbidden, not is a question. The question in such culture as our culture in the 21 century, very secular, it will be understood by many. It is a first step for priesthood. And so many will reject it and refuse to accept it and make problem in the church and may we have schism. Now, unfortunately, I know there are some churches and some metropolitans who are so liberal and who are maybe so traitor, I don't know, I don't condemn, but they walk with this phenomena of secular uh, society and they allow for some women to be reader to and in the last months you heard about a deacon woman in the Baboy in um, Africa and her ordination um, makes and still making uh, a great conflict in the whole Orthodox churches. Churches, we don't know what is the result for, for that. So we should be aware, especially our archdiocese have many new converts. And you know, those converts, they left their churches because of the liberal movement in their churches. They, they left it. So when they come to our church and we do like their churches had done before 30 or 40 years, they will be against it and they are right because they say, according to their experience, when their altar churches started by such practices, Directly, directly during 15 years, they did many heresies. So to go down, to deteriorate is very easy because Satan help us to, to go down with our church. So we should be so wise. Thank you, Sayedna. The next two questions are also very similar, so I'm going to read them both. 
They have to do with receiving Holy Communion. Question 15. I have been in several Orthodox churches and at Holy Liturgy, most of them, the priest will have parishioners tilt their head back, open their mouths wide to receive the Holy Gifts. At our parish, the majority of parishioners close their mouth on the Holy Spoon, and that makes me feel that it is sacrilegious. Please give us your spiritual guidance on this. And someone else writes, Your Eminence, please teach us the proper way to take the Holy Communion, and how should the priests give us the sacraments? Some prefer different disposable spoons. Some want to gently place it in the mouth, while others toss it in. Issues have arisen after illnesses in the parish, and we see differences with sister churches. Thank you for clarifying. Well, in our Orthodox Church, we still give the Holy Communion through special spoon. We use it for the Holy Communion only. This is the way until now. There is no instruction in the Orthodox Church say how the faithful should receive the Holy Communion. He, sh he should close his lips upon the spoon or not. There is no typical, no... Uh, what uh, Hard rule. Say, uh, what? What is well, the word? Rule, no definite rule? Uh, no definite rule, yeah. No def rubric. The, in the rubric, liturgical rubric, there is nothing about this. We have it through the spoon. For this reason, my, my guidance is to not force the people to close their uh, mouths. We should not shout at them and order them to close, as some priests do. And at the same time, it is good to give them in the proper way in proper way and to put the whole body and blood, the holy body and the blood in the mouth of everyone. So in the clergy symposium in the next month, I will talk with our priest how to do that. You know? But we should not order them to close or to not close. What the faithful should do is to to have little little kneel to be lower than the chalice. Then the priest can put and pour the Holy Communion easily in the open mouth, in the open mouth. But there are some practices here and there. Some practices we have because of over piety. Close your tongue, close your mouth. We buy this close and something like that, over piety. And at the same time, we have many practices because people fear, especially after the pandemic, Corona or COVID. Uh, this was a shock for many people whose face were not so strong and they fear because of the pandemic. And the media around the pandemic was so strong and so differences, even the physicians and the medical scholars talk different things. So people were lost and were fearful at the same time. And this reflect in reflect in the church. For this reason, we we have we had at that time a great and hot debate between the uh, faithful and between the uh, bishops and the priests. If we allow to use another way or to not, or, or but anyway, any. Yani, we couldn't find one answer because the debate was so hot, so high. It was not peaceful debate. So after the pandemic, we came back to our traditional uh, 
uh, practice. Practice. Thank but you. I advise the faithful and the priest, the faithful should be lower a little bit in front of the chalice and raise up their, their head in this way and open their mouth. Some people, because of piety, come and bend their how How can I find the, their mouth <laughs> when they bend? I tell them, raise up. Bend before and make metania and prostration before you come to the chalice. But in front of the chalice, raise up your hair, heart, uh, head, and open your mouth to give you Israel. Thank you, Sadna. 17. We're making progress. <laughs> Should couples married outside of the church or married prior to converting to orthodoxy, have a crowning service once they are orthodox? I don't know the practice here in the archdiocese. And no one asked me this question until now. Until now. Uh, I know who didn't crown in the Christian church. They need when they become Orthodox, to be crowned in the Orthodox Church. But not all the Christian churches now are the same. Some has uh, sacraments and some has no sacraments. And the Orthodox also have not, don't have the same opinion. Some Orthodox don't believe in the sacraments of the other churches, even the traditional churches. So it depends upon the area and upon the church where they were crowned and something like that. But as I know, after I came to the archdiocese, each couple case is discussed by itself in the archdiocese. This is the practice we have until now. Thank you, Sadna. Number 18. What is the difference between the fall of man and the fall of angels? Oh, this is a theological uh, question. Yes, the fall of angel, uh, we don't know exactly why the fall was happened. We know from some gestures and signs in the Bible that some of angels rebelled against God. Why, what their goal was, we don't know. We just know that they rebel against God. At the same time, they have no repentance. They don't repent. They refuse to be repentant. While the fall of man, we know the reason and why man had fallen. And at the same time, there is repentance for man and he can restore himself to the situation he was in before the, the fall, before the fall. This is the two differences we do. Because you know, what we know in our face is re revealed by our God in the Bible. We don't know by ourselves. We know because God revealed it to us through the Bible and the Holy Spirit. So we, we know these two differences. We could come back and be saved, especially after Christ. Open us the way of salvation. We can come back to our paradise and repent. While Satan uh, cannot repent because he refused to repent. This is a big difference. 
Is it clear or do you want more clarification? Thank you, Sedna. No, I, I think for this context, I think that, you know, I'm sure it could be a whole day seminar. <laughs> Um, number 19, in this tumultuous world, how can we women cope and be more like our beloved Theotokos in our daily lives? The more we keep peace in ourselves and patience and silence, we are like the Theotokos more and more. There is a beautiful word in the gospel about Theotokos. The gospel says she used to keep everything in her heart. And at the same time, after the angel asked her to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit, she told him, I am handmaid of God. She accept, and we know from the gospel, she didn't complain one time. She didn't talk nonsense one time. So the more men and women keep peace in ourselves, keep our tongue silent for the not important and not good things, and the more we are obedient to our God, we are similar to the Theotokos. Beautiful. Thank you, Sedna. Number 21. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Number 20. Is there going to be an updated version of the Liturgicon? Yes, yes. Are you interested by Liturgicon? Bravo. <laughs> Yes, we are working, we are working to make one rubric in the Archdiocese. So all the priests do the same practice, pray the liturgy, Eucharist, baptism, Vespers, Orthros, all, all the uh, prayers of the church, they do it at the same time. So we are working now there. There are some priests who know Greek, Arabic, and, and English who are working to have in the next year, I hope, it is available, I hope, uh, one big and detailed uh, liturgicon in English and one rubric, which is a rubric according to the Antiochian tradition. And so all our churches have the same practice. We hope that. Inshallah. Inshallah. Question 21, you already answered with this one because 21 is, are we going to standardize how the liturgy is prayed so that it is the same in each parish? So from what you're saying, that is what you're working towards. Yes. Beautiful. 22, we're getting close. In this current turbulent world, how do I live? How do I work out my salvation? Should I ignore the turbulence? How can I live in the world and not be of the world? How do I thrive? What is the balance? This could yes. be an all day seminar also. <laughs> very, very important yes. A question. <laughs> you know, Christ asked us to be in the world but do not forget that we are not from this world. We don't belong to this world. What he means by this? This world is not the world which God created for us. It is not the paradise, not the kingdom of God. It is a fallen world because man had fallen from the paradise. So he lives in a fallen world. This world wants always to do according to his mind. Everything is according to the mind of the world. 
It means not according to the mind of God. Why Christian should live according to the mind of God, isn't it? So there is conflict here. And there is what we call it jihad, but in the spiritual meaning, not like Islamic jihad. Eh? Strive, striving, we struggle. We do our best to overcome the temptation and to do according to the mind of Christ, not according to the mind of our world and our society. For example, now we have phenomena of uh, homosexual. According to the gospel and to the Bible, this is a sin. According to the society, to our world now, it is not a sin, it is a choice. And everyone is free to have his choice. So what we follow, we follow the mind and the instruction of our world, of the instruction and the mind of the gospel. We as a Christian should follow the gospel. Another thing, our clothes. Our society doesn't care by what we call it hashme in Arabic, I don't know in English, but to, to, to wear modesty and in decent way, uh, not to our, our, our body to be so, so visible and seen. You, you see many kinds and many styles of words. Uh, yesterday, some uh, use show me the last trend, which is the trouser is at the bottom of the, of the feet and people are walking without trouser. Trouser is like the, like the socks. So this is a trend. Many follow it. For me as a Christian, should I follow it or follow the teaching of Christ? This is the, uh, uh, our, our spiritual striving as a Christian, as a Christian. So we need, we need to build our community as a Christian with each other, to not live alone. I cannot face this society by myself. I need my brothers and sisters. For this reason, our parishes should be one family and should be one spiritual to encourage each other, to support each other. And this is very important for all of us, especially for our children of our youth. For this reason, I encourage them. I encourage the priests, the parish councils, invite them for mutual activities, meetings, to build friendship with each other, to feel that they are supported by each other. This is a church, one family. We support each other because it's not easy to face such very open, very liberal, very secular eh, style of life. But for each one of us as person, we need to keep a rhythm in our life, to have a rhythm daily, to have dedicate some time for ourselves and God. Five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, it's up to each one. He can ask his spiritual father, spiritual confessor, eh? but also it depends upon his work, his business, how, how he has time. But we need to dedicate special time every year 
to pray in the morning and at night, at least, and to read some words of the Bible and of spiritual teaching of the Holy Fathers. This is our canon. And during the day, as possible as we remember from time to time to say Jesus' prayer in our heart three, four times. Every two hours, every three hours, whenever we remember, it is good to keep the presence of God in ourselves and in our mind. When we have this read, we keep ourselves more than when we live without rule and without regret. This is daily, and from time to time, it is good to make retreat for each, all of you, for all of you together in, in the parish, to make retreat for women, retreat for family, have one weekday, uh, weekend, one day of the weekend on Saturday, for example, half of the Saturday to pray more together in the church, to go on the picnic uh, and read the gospel and discuss about some spiritual issue of your life. Uh, this is a great support to each of us. I am a metropolitan. I cannot live without such rule and such read. We should keep this thing. This helps us so much. Thank you, Seba. The last three that we have, and then I have one bonus question, but the last three that we have are all on the same topic. So I'll read them all. It has to do with some challenges people might be having with their clergy. Uh, should a parish priest deliver personal political, this is number 23, Santa. Should a parish priest deliver personal political opinions or vaccine positions to the parish during a homily? What should a homily contain and how long should it be? 24, can a parish priest refuse to commune a confessing, praying, pious parishioner for voting for a political candidate that is a Democrat? Is it okay for a parish priest to ask about who you're voting for? How involved in the political scene should parishioners and the parish priest be since our kingdom is not of this world? <clears throat> Finally, in the same arena, should a parish priest discourage parishioners to care about the deaths of Palestinian people because Muslims have oppressed Christians in the historical past? How invested in the success of Israel as the Jewish state should a parish or a parish priest be? I know those are heavy. Well, for the first question, <clears throat> unfortunately now, we have different positions in the churches. There are some currents in the church who refuse the vaccine completely. And they believe that it is kind of antichrist. But the official church didn't say that. So I think we cannot preach in the church for the faithful what to do and what not to do. We preach them what gospel say to do and what gospel say to not do. And out of the sermon, we can teach them about some detailed things. We can explain to them what is happening, but we cannot tell them openly you have to do this and you have to not to do this. This is a lesson we learned from COVID and the pandemic. Because from that time until now, we have unfortunately many currents in the church and they are against each other because they have different and contradicted positions. For the second question, priest can refuse to commune a faithful in one case when he is sure that he is not repentant. 
for example, if I know as I as, as a priest, I know this man doesn't talk with his sister and he refused to reconcile her and he refused to forgive her. I have right to tell him you cannot take the Holy Communion, but not for political reasons. This is personal freedom, according to our church. The role of the priest is to teach people and to encourage them to play their role as a good citizens. But he should not tell them to do, to support this wing and to refuse that wing. This is not the message of the church. This is very important. Politic is out of the church. Church is a family of diversities, people. Each one has his attitude, his position politically according to his conscience. We as spiritual fathers, we should help our people and our parishioners to know what Christian, what politic movement do according to Christian way, but not to tell them you should refute this and you should follow this and that. And to use the Holy Communion for such political things is, is, is a heresy, is a heresy, something not acceptable at all in that church. For the last the question, we as a Christian should forgive. St. Peter asked Christ, for how many times? Seven times I forgive? What the, our, our Lord answer was for 77. So if some fanatic Muslim kill Christian, we don't help and support the oppressed Muslim in any place, this is not a Christian position. We should forgive. And at the same time, to say the truth, there are many good Muslims who don't accept Christian to be killed by Muslim just because they are Christian. In the last years in Syria, and uh, Soha is with us, I think, uh, was in Tara, where the, the war started in Syria in 2011. And I was the metropolitan of this area. I know very well and I lived with them until I came to, to America in the last year, 2040 years I was there and uh, from 2011 until 2023 I was a metropolitan then. Many Muslim people defended Christian to not be killed by the fanatic movement. These are politic, politician, political movements. Huh? It is not time now to explain about them. But also we should be honest, not all the Muslim want to kill a Christian. But even though we should not hate. Hated is very awful. And um, mortal, we say, mortal. Mortal, we cannot hate as a Christian. Thank you, Sedna. I, I have a bonus question. It's from me. I didn't submit it yes. because, of course, the questions I were being submitted online to me. So I grew up in this church. I love being Orthodox. And I think about my situ in Jiddu when they came 
and struggled in the depression to build our help build our churches. And now I look and see our churches growing so fast with so many converts. And it's so exciting because there's such, you've spoken of diversity, such a diverse group. And it's so wonderful. I can't imagine what my Situ and Jiddu would have thought of it. I'm sure they'd be excited, but I, I know they could never have visualized it. But I would like your um, insight as to why you think we're seeing such incredible growth from so many, such a diverse swath of people. I think there are many reasons. First, there are reasons from Protestant background. You know, Protestant started in the 15th century. And when Martin Luther started his reform, he had two things. Sola Scriptura, which means Bible alone. Anyone baptized can read the Bible and understand it and interpret it. And the second, they kicked out all the tradition of the heritage of the church from the beginning until Martin Luther. So because Bible alone and everyone can enter, understand it and interpret it, now there are thousands of different Protestant churches. Isn't it? Yes. So there is a question in the Protestant circles, which is the authentic church which Christ had established. We see thousands of churches and very different. There are great varieties among them. Which one is the authentic? Which one is the origin? They study the history of church, history of liturgia, history of the fathers, holy fathers, history of the saints, history of the dogma. They discover that the Orthodox Church is the original. This is one reason. Second Protestant reason. I told you they kicked out all the tradition and the heritage of Christian church for 15 centuries. Now, after five centuries of Protestantism, they know that they have a tradition. Billy Graham is a great father in, in their churches. Barclay, Zwingli, Luther. So they ask themselves, after 500 years, we have a tradition which is Protestant evangelical tradition. Why we accept tradition of 500 years and we refuse the tradition of 1,500 years. This is another existential question. So they come back to the history and they discover that the Orthodox Church is the best, is the original one. For this reason, they come back to the Orthodox Church. This is when uh, reasons from the Protestant background. There are another reasons because of the society. Society now is very secular, very liberal, very material, materialistic. But people more and more feel chaos in themselves, feel they are alone feel they need spiritual life, they need spirituality, they need meaning for their life. 
everything was destroyed. And cannot be, man cannot be satisfied by money, cannot be satisfied by lust, cannot be satisfied by science. In the last century, humanity had a dream that science will find solution for everything. Now we are not so dreamy as people. We see that science has many advantages, but it has also many disadvantages. So they look for meaning of their life, for spirituality, for love. Some people come to our churches because they find family. They find who smile in their face. You invite them for a cup of coffee. So the Orthodox Church can offer an answer for these people. So for this reason, they come and they come to our Antiochian Archdiocese, especially because there are many of them before, because as I told you in the beginning, we open the door to them, to them. But this phenomena also is very good, but at the same time should be studied well because this growing uh, so fast has some, some disadvantage in the future for the archdiocese. We should study it well because we should not be happy just to welcome them. We should ask ourselves about our responsibility, how we can feed them later, not just to baptize them. And we are happy we baptized 20, we baptized 50, but about later we should feed them. So we, we have a great responsibility. We, we should study it also with a priest as soon, God willing. But thank God, thank God, our church is existed and we can do a great service for those people and to tell them where is their, their uh, salvation. Thank you, Sedna. Someone did put one question. I think it'll be quick, if that's okay, in the chat. And that is yeah. um, about, if you could just reconfirm the rules for mothers with newborns, and do we still follow the 40-day rule? What do you mean by rule? The 40-day tradition of bringing a new baby to the church at 40 days, do we still follow that? Yeah, well, we, we bring our babies on the 40 days. So that is something is that they, they're asking, is that what we're still doing? Do we still follow that rule? So yes, 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 of course, of course. And then we have some another person who just wanted to thank you. And I'm sure that the her comments are shared by so many. I'm going to read it. She still wants to thank you for doing this and, and ask, can we do this again sometime? <laughs> Whenever you want. Whenever you. you want, you can ask freely. I am so happy to be with you. Thank you so much. God bless you, your families, your houses, your children, your all relatives. God bless you. One family in church in Christ. Um, Connie, do you want to tune back in? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Sadna. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. This has been wonderful. I've got three pages of notes that I've been writing throughout the throughout the <laughs> evening. Thank you so much. And I'm going to take you up on getting together and doing this again um, sometime in the near future. Uh, and uh, I like the idea of uh, maybe touching base with other uh, jurisdictions and see if they possibly want to uh, join us. So thank you. I am ready. I am ready. As we say in French, à votre service. Okay, very I'm good. I am ready. Okay, I'm sounds ready. good. Uh, say, Edna, will you please close us out with a prayer for all of us? Um, that I, We would appreciate that. Please may may Charlene send me the names of all the women, please. I certainly will, Sadna. Names, yeah. 
Yes, I, I will. Remember. Name of the parishes, I will. Okay. Good night. So will you, you, well, Sin, are you going to close us in prayer? Yes, but I don't, I don't memorize in English. That's okay. Do it in Arabic. Say it, say it in Arabic. That's okay. Okay. When you make the sign of the cross, we will too. I think let, let us let us close with our Father. All of us memorize okay. it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day, day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we put trespass against us. And lead us yes. not into temptation. For Zion is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Christ is risen. Christ is truly is risen. Truly is risen. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you, Sayedna. Thank you, Sayedna. Bye. Thank you, Sayedna. <laughs> I don't know how how I close it. <laughs> well, I'll be closing the whole thing and that'll that'll take care of it. Okay. okay. Thank you, Sayedna, Thank very you. much. Thank you, Sayedna. Thank, Thank you, Sayedna. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Good night. Good night.